Moses began to see that the issue was a lot more complex than just an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting and he, he said to the one in the wrong, or he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Uh, now Moses is confused. He realized the issue is not just the Egyptians being the oppressors, but he saw the brokenness now within his own people, the disunity, the fractured culture that they were living in. And the man said, well, who made you ruler and judge? Again, he dismissed Moses because he saw Moses as a man of privilege. He didn't see him as somebody who he would invite into their struggle. Uh, are you going to kill me the way you killed that other Egyptian? And Moses was afraid and thought, what I, what I did may have become known. And as Moses began to identify with his own people, he saw that it was not just an Egyptian problem. It was, you know, he saw Hebrew on Hebrew crime. It was a much difficult, uh, more pervasive issue than he even knew at first. And, and really, of course, the root of it is sin, right? It's, it's sin. And that sin lived within his own people as well. The sins of hatred, jealousy, anger, rage, malice, greed, selfishness. You know, racism is just one form of that. But the root cause of all the chaos in this world is not racism. The root cause is sin. And as we begin to, barrage, uh, to be barraged with these news stories, the one thing we have to keep in mind is that the root issue actually is sin. Racism is not an American invention. It's not even a white or a Caucasian invention. The story that we're now reading is, is about the Hebrews. Who were they enslaved by? They were enslaved by an African people, the, the Egyptians of North Africa, enslaving the Chaldeans, uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who had moved uh, out of Chaldea, the fertile crescent of Iraq, into Canaan, and eventually settled in Egypt, and then became enslaved and mistreated for almost 400 years. And so, again, uh, sin is rampant in every community. Uh, and some crimes definitely are racially motivated. There's no doubt about that. But for argument's sake, if we eliminated all racism, would that eliminate all injustice? Would it eliminate murder or rape or immorality or abortion or rage or anger or bitterness or child abuse or all these other uh, maladies that are going on in our world today? Uh, racism is simply one form of that that's on the forefront of the news right now. But God wants us to be a voice, voice for change, and he's calling us. And my prayer is that by faith, you will identify with an issue and allow God to use you to be an agent of change on that issue. Moses came to the painful realization that his people were broken and his efforts to be a voice for change were no longer, were actually not welcome at that time. And so he fled. Uh, Exodus 2 says, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and lived uh, in Midian where he sat down by a well. A priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill the uh, troughs to water their father's flock. And some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their defense and came to their rescue and watered uh, their flock. You know, again, here Moses is, again, fighting injustice. Racism is certainly a predominant issue in the news right now. But, but let us remember that God all, sees all who are marginalized and victimized. In this instance, Moses saw a, a group of seven daughters uh, of, of Jethro being, uh, you know, harassed by a group of shepherds. And, and he stuck up for them. You got to love Moses that he, he really, you know, injustice of any form begins to really bother him. Um, so Moses spends the first 40 years of his life conflicted about his identity. When he identifies with the Hebrews and begins to speak out, uh, he, he, he is not a credible voice for change even in their community. And so in some ways, he just disengages for the next 40 years. He's now going to live with his new father-in-law, Jethro, who is a priest and a shepherd, the two things that Moses will become for the Israelite nation. Uh, he will be their priest and he will be their shepherd uh, during their wandering years in the desert. Uh, but right now he is going to disengage from this movement for about 40 years. And, and I understand that. I understand just wanting to get off the grid and just turn off the news and get off Facebook and, and just sort of bury my head in the sand. I think that's a little bit what Moses did. And yet God begins to recruit him back to the cause of the Hebrew people. And so God comes to Moses in Exodus chapter three and four from a, uh, calls him from a burning bush in Midian. And the Lord says to him, you know, I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. Now, what do we learn from this scripture? Four things about God. He sees, he hears, he's concerned and he will come and act. You know, and I think, gosh, do I want to imitate God in these four areas? Do I want to see these videos and this, news cycle is very hard to see. I don't want to watch sometimes, and I don't want to believe the narrative that's out there that, that may really be true, uh, that there is a systemic racism that has played out in our country for years and that it is time for a change. It's hard to see that. 
if that's not your heritage. But you have to see that by faith if you want to be a voice for change. Do I want to hear? You know, do I really want to hear the cries of people that are not my people in a sense? By faith, do I want to identify with those people and invite stories into my life, invite people into my life that have a different story than mine, that are able to educate me about their story, that are able to help me to hear a voice that I may not have heard before. I'm so grateful for people uh, being patient with me and, and, and telling me their stories. These conversations that we're having in the church right now are, are a rich part, I think, of the unity of our fellowship going forward. And am I concerned? Really, that's, that was the next step for God to, to see it, to hear it, and then to be concerned. You know, I think for me, there's a desire to sometimes limit the trauma uh, that I expose myself to. Uh, you know, I can't take every cause. So, uh, you know, as a minister and as a person, I think studies have shown, you know, as you expose yourself to other people's trauma, and this happens in any service industry, in the medical field, in the professional field, in you know, being a counselor, being a teacher, being a, an administrator, as you uh, experience other people and listen to their trauma, a residual amount of that trauma is going to stay with you. It's going to become your trauma. Uh, and, and gosh, in the ministry, that's, that's certainly true. And so yet I think all of us as Christians, as followers of Christ, not just ministers, we're all called to do that. The Bible calls us in Galatians 6, 2, to carry each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. So we kind of have to do that if we want to be followers of God. And then do we want to and get, do we want to act? As God came and acted on their behalf, do we want to act, engage? God may indeed be choosing you. Uh, and like Moses, he said, well, he started the conversation by saying, who am I <laughs> that I should engage in this battle? And he ended the conversation with saying, just please send somebody else. And, and maybe that's where we're at today, you know. I, this is not my cause. Who am I to be a voice for change uh, in, in this arena? Um, maybe God will just choose somebody else, but maybe God will choose you. Maybe you are indeed in the right place at the right time to be a voice for change. Let's, uh, let's continue on. In Exodus 3, um, Moses asks God something. It's, a re it's kind of a weird question. He says, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? What shall I tell them? You know, have you ever forgotten somebody's name and you just hope it comes up in the conversation and you know you should know who they are, but you've just drawn a blank? I think that was Moses' situation. I think he knew all the Egyptian gods by name, but he had no idea who the Hebrew God was. He had no idea who the God of his people were. And so I think he's just trying to trick God into asking, into asking God's name and maybe God will tell him who his name is. And God does tell him his name. In fact, he tells him three aspects about himself that Moses learns very quickly about God. God reveals himself to Moses in a very real way. And he says, I am who I am. That's what you should say to the Israelites. The I am has sent me to you. And then he says, say to the Israelites, the Lord. And that word there is the tetragamma, the, the, the word we use, Yahweh, uh, the four letter, Hebrew letters uh, that depict the name of God uh, that is too holy to be pronounced. And so Adonai, Lord, is, is used as a substitute. That, that that is the name of God that he, he reveals to him his name. And then lastly, he says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. Three things that God identifies uh, himself to reveal himself to Moses. Uh, the I am, that, that is a weird name, isn't it? The I am has sent me, but it's based on the Hebrew verb. It's a verb, chaya, which means to be or to make come to pass. It's the first words of God in the entire Bible in Genesis. Uh, chapter one, when it says, God said, let there be light. He really says, Chaya, light, let there be light. And so I think what God was really telling Moses is that I am the creator of everything. I created the heavens and the earth, the sun, the stars, the mountains, the oceans, the birds, the creatures, uh, all the land animals. Uh, God created mankind. Uh, he, in fact, he created man, all of man out of one man. So uh, we are all really sons of Adam. When we see injustice in the world, uh, we must identify by faith. These are our people. We are all created by God. Uh, so what a, what a great introduction to who God is, that no Egyptian God did all these things. There is no God of the sun, God of the sea, God of the Nile, God of the night, God of the stars, God of the you know, fertility. It, it, there is one God. One God created all of this. And again, he pronounces his name, uh, Yeho uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, whatever we would pronounce it. We don't know really the, the pronunciation that God, but God told Moses something about himself. Uh, and it, you know, the, the word we use is Adonai, which is a plural word, Lord. Even the God uh, Elohim is, is plural. And so uh, 
Moses learns that though God is one God, he is plural in nature, meaning God exists in his spoken word. He exists in his creative uh, father form. He also exists in the breath, the, the spirit form, which means that God's spirit desires to live in us. God wants to live in us. God can live in us and speak through us. Very exciting to see God begin to reveal himself to Moses and teach him about himself because Moses didn't know who this God was. And the last thing he learned was that this was the God of his ancestors, Moses' ancestors, Moses' people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses struggled to have a connection with his own people. But now God is telling him, no, you are descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are not going to be an outsider to this story anymore. You're going to be part of the story of the Hebrew people. As you grow up, each and every one of us, we need to understand who our identity is. You, you have parents and grandparents, yes, uh, but that alone does not define you. As you begin to connect with your God, with the one God of the Bible, uh, your identity and purpose will be made more and more clear to you. Uh, and, and you do not have to remain an outsider or a loner. God wants you to join in his story. And Moses finishes by saying, you know, Lord, I've never been eloquent. I'm slow of speech and tongue. I don't know how to talk to these people. I don't know the language. I don't know your name. I don't know our history. Uh, you know, it's more than just slow of tongue and speech. It's, it's more that he just doesn't know what to say to these people. He didn't grow up around them. Uh, he grew up speaking a different language. The Hebrew language was a second language to him. And so it's like, I can't speak to them in a language that they would understand even. Uh, Moses feels like he's the last person that should do this. And that yet God says, no, 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 my breath my words, I will speak with you. When God's spirit comes inside of you, God is going to rearrange things in your life. God is going to make you a voice uh, for change in this world. And you may be the most unlikely person to do it. But my hope is that God uh, will fill this church with his spirit and be a voice for change in our world. God desires us to be a voice for change and a voice for unity. May God help each of us to find our voice, to be agents of change in our world. Amen.